Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 27. <clears throat> we'll pick up where we left off, verse 13, but I want to read verse 12 again. <clears throat> That says, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. There's a verse in Chronicles that says the sons of Issachar were men who understood the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. They were men that understood the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. One of the ministries that Jesus promised us of the Holy Spirit, and I'm praying that God would revive us in our understanding and belief in the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our midst. He said he will show you things to come. I'm going to say something in the moment that I say it, unfortunately, many people are going to be like, okay, that, that kind of sounds a little weird and, and spooky. I believe that the disciples of Christ should be living their lives in the prophetic. I believe that's the way we should be living our lives, right? If Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit is going to show us things to come, it's one of his ministries. It's one of the things that he desires to do to help us see what we can't see, to help us know what we can't know, to help us to remember what we have forgotten. Think about what he desires to do within us. No wonder Jesus says, greater works than these shall ye do. And what did Jesus say we would do? Well, what did he do? Jesus was a healer. He was a healer. And some would say, well, yeah, but that was Jesus, right? I mean, he went around and he healed people. Some would even dare to argue, well, well he gave power to the apostles to go and, and heal people as well. And that was just for them, not for anyone else. And I'll say, okay, well, I'll even meet you there. James tells us to lay hands on the sick and pray for them. So if your faith doesn't allow you to believe that the Holy Spirit can do in you what he did in Jesus and what he did in the apostles, then surely we can pray. Do we not still believe that the God we serve is a healer? Yeah. He healed. He delivered. His kingdom ministry was about healing. It was about deliverance. And it was about the prophetic. Jesus knew things about people. And nobody else knew. What might happen if people today would believe the Lord enough to just let him do what he wants to do in our lives? A prudent man sees. He sees. So I ask you tonight, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see on the horizon? What is the Lord showing you? Lately, he's been showing me some exciting things. 
And I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to what is coming. Verse 13 says, Take his garment that is surety for a stranger and take a pledge for him for a strange woman. Over and over and over and over and over and over again in the scripture, Solomon warns us in this book about co-signing and loans and those type of things. He, he says here that, that, that you need a pledge, you need collateral, you, you shouldn't just be loaning money to a stranger because you don't know them. And if you don't know someone, well, how in the world are you supposed to trust them? And then he moves from the stranger to the man who engages with the strange woman. If your spouse can't trust you, don't ask me to. If you can't be faithful with your marriage vows, don't come knocking on my door for a loan. You can't be trusted. I believe that's what, what he's saying. We, we need to remember that money is math. Money is math. Money's not a feeling. Money's not an emotion. People who link their money to feelings and emotion are soon departed from it. We need wisdom when it comes to finances. Sunday, we, we mentioned that verse where Jesus says, if you can't be trusted in the unrighteous mammon, who will entrust to you the true riches? So the way I take that is, is the way that I handle my money is, is kind of like a, a test, a precursor to, to what I might do if someone would really entrust something to me that is of great value. Verse 14, <laughs> he that blesseth his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. This verse reminds me that it is not enough to do a good thing. We've got far too many Christians who are willing to do a good thing without doing it right. You can do something good to bless a friend in the morning. That's good. But with a loud voice, that's not the right way. Because your friend, who's still rubbing the sleep out of his eyes, maybe still half groggy, maybe he's like my mother. Until you've had a, several cups of coffee, you didn't even talk to her. You, you, I didn't even speak to my mom. She would give me the, she'd give me the green light. It's okay now. I don't know anything of that. I, I haven't had caffeine in almost 28 years, so um, it's not a problem with me. So, and I rise early in the morning, too, so you can, you can bless me as loud as you want to bless me. But, 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 but everybody is not that way, right? There's, it's not enough to do something good. We need to start doing it in the right way. I'll give you some biblical examples, right? Serving the Lord is a good thing. There's a lot of people who want to serve the Lord, but the scripture says, serve the Lord with gladness. So it's not just enough to do a good thing. It needs to be done in the right way. So yes, bless your friend, but if it's first thing in the morning, use your inside voice. Walk in there and say, good morning, sleepyhead. It's, this is the day the Lord's made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it, right? That, there, there's, there, there's a right way to do right things. Here's another one. Speak the truth. All believers are about speaking the truth. We're all about speaking the truth. But, but the Lord says it's not enough just to speak the truth. He says speak the truth 
in love. Doing the right thing the right way. It's important. The Bible says, don't let your good be evilly spoken of. We got a lot of believers that are doing things and people are saying bad things about it because they're just not doing it right. One of the greatest debates within the church, not the great, because there's a bunch of them, unfortunately. I, I, I had the privilege of, of speaking to a group of 40 men last night at, at a men's get together. And, and, and after the study, several guys kind of gathered around me and were asking me some questions. And, and we stayed pretty late after everyone else left. And I was talking with them about the subject of tongues. And that's one of those things that people have done right, but not the right way. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that if you do good things the wrong way, you're just a sounding gong and a clanging cymbal. It just becomes noise. And the purpose of ministry at any level is success. And we're already fighting unbelief. We're fighting the enemy. We're fighting all of the rest. The last thing I need to do, the last thing you need to do is get in the way yourself by the way you do something. Do the right thing the right way. And it would be more receptive. It, it'll be received even better. So for whatever that's worth, there you go. Verses 15 and 16 is a, a familiar concept that we've looked at in Proverbs. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whoever hideth her hideth the wind. How many of you know that you can't hide the wind? Right? You can't grasp it. You can't hide it. You can't, you can't tame it. And the ointment of his right hand, which bereath itself. I know a lot of men who have used this verse out of context. I've heard men use this verse in describing their wife. And in reality, She's not being contentious. She's crying out. But because he doesn't want to be bothered, he just calls it contention. It's easy to call it contention and dismiss it. The truth about the matter is, is contention shouldn't be a part of any believer's life, male or female. And we've already studied in Proverbs that only by pride cometh contention. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Servants aren't into striving. I ain't got time for that. I don't have time to be arguing with you. I don't have time to be arguing with my wife. I don't have to, time to be arguing with my neighbor, with my children. I don't have time for arguing. I got a master to please. And he tells me to be like him is to be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. He tells me in Romans 12, as much as lieth within you, exhaust everything that you have, deplete all of your options and resources, live at peace with most, no. With the ones you like, no. All men, all men. Now, here's what's interesting. In order to accomplish that, now, that, that verse implies that it's not going to always be possible. How many of you know there's some folks that just don't want to get along with you? 
<laughs> no matter what you do. You could do everything in your power to try to please them. They're still going to find something to get mad about. But if our hearts are filled with the Prince of Peace, then our desire is going to be for peace. And do you know that reconciliation cannot take place unless someone dies? The Bible tells us that God reconciled us to himself through the death of his son. Now, who do you think in that relationship was wrong? Right. I was to blame for the relationship that I had with the Lord before my salvation. But the Bible tells me that while I was yet a sinner, not only had I, had I wronged him, I was willfully, consciously, and continuously living in rebellion against him. And you know what he did? He said, Gordon, I love you. So I'll die. You can't. You won't. I will. So his disciples sound like this. Honey, I'll take the blame. It's my fault. What can I do to make it better? How can I help you? How can I resolve this? His disciples sound like this. Listen, son, I... I, I I'm not sure what, what's causing this, this tension between us. I don't know if it's something that you're struggling with or if it's something that I've done to you. But, but look, I, I just, I, I want to make this right. I'll die to save this. I'll die to save this. It grieves me. And I don't, I don't think it grieves me so much because I'm a pastor. I think it grieves me because of who I used to be. It grieves me because I know what it's like to be that contentious man. And now I know what it's like to be delivered from that. And I know what it's like to have God's love melt my heart. And... and and to have that consuming fire burn away all of that within me that, that caused me to be that way. So, so I'm ruined. I know what God can do. And so when I see my brothers and sisters living where I used to live, it, it just breaks my heart because I know they don't have to live there. I know they don't have to carry that in their lives. And, but I'm sick of seeing church folks always wanting to fight. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of seeing married couples in the church. Constantly bickering. Constantly at odds with one another. Especially when Jesus has said to us, your relationship is like a picture book for the world to see my love for my church. People ought to look at me and Cindy and have a greater understanding of the gospel. 
they ought to see me giving myself for my bride. Just giving and giving and giving and loving and loving and loving and be able to go, that's what that looks like. When they hear the gospel, they should be able to go, I see, I see, there's a picture. Contention. Verse 17. Love this verse. This is one of those verses in the Bible that seem to be memorized quickly and liked by most people, but experienced very little. Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. How many believe that God said it is not good that man should be alone? Now, we tend to think that and go, oh, well, he's talking about marriage. And, and I do think that was implied. But I think it goes far beyond that. How many of you believe that discipleship is a team sport? It's a team sport. I had someone call me today, and they're involved in a Bible study, and they were, they were, they were, they were like, I, you know, I'm not really calling you because I want an answer. I, maybe I'm just calling to vent. I don't know, but I'll just kind of leave that up to you. And, but, but, but we're in this Bible study, and, and there's certain people that just, they want to just take over the whole Bible study and discussion, and they just want to talk the whole time. And, and some of them are rude, and some of them want to bicker their point and argue, and, and they're just sharing these things. And so I, I was able to give some guidelines and some things that I've learned through the years that, that might help them. But, but I said, one of the things you might want to remind this group of believers is, Paul tells us in the scripture that we are, we are members in particular. So, so, so individually, we are members of the body. We, we don't lose our individuality. And so in my quiet time, I, I can do whatever I want to do, right? I can shout loud. I can be quiet. I can sit there for 30 minutes. I can talk constantly. I can, that, that's between me and the Lord. I can be selfish in that moment. But when I come together corporately, I'm not just a member. I'm part of the body. So my focus at that point Right now, tonight, my focus is not me. My focus must be the body as a whole. So what happens collectively has to edify all of us. It should build up all of us. We've got too many lone rangers in the church. There are actually men and women in the church that believe give me Jesus and you can have the church. I'll take Jesus all day long but you can have the church. Now let me tell you <laughs> what that looks like. I won't leave it to your imagination. I'll tell you if you walked up to me and said, Gordon, I like you. I, I, I want to have a relationship with you. I, I want to get to know you more. Um, I, I want to foster that and see where that goes. But, but I just got to tell you. I can't stand Cindy. She gets on my nerves. I do not like her. There are things that she does that just drive me insane. I don't even want to be around her. Anybody want to guess what our future relationship's going to look like? Not mine and Cindy's. Mine and the person that walked up to me and said, I want you, but not her. This thing called discipleship, and I'm convinced, listen, I am convinced, church, I am convinced that part of the problem with the church as a whole, when we look across the church, we just kind of go like, what? 
We've lost community. You say, wait a minute, no, we haven't, Gordon. There's, there's small groups and there's home fellowships and there's connect groups and, 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 and churches are filled with all of that stuff. I know, I know. I know it is. But let me ask you a question. Are those people growing in their relationship with Christ? Are they developing as disciples? And I'm sure some of them are, but most are not. Because discipleship is uncomfortable to the flesh. Discipleship is very, very uncomfortable to the flesh. Jesus starts making his way through Galilee and the surrounding area. And he starts calling people. And they're not the kind of people that I would call. If I were going to put together my group, I probably wouldn't pick a woman that was possessed by seven demons. How about you? Or fishermen. I'm not against fishermen. But they'd rather be fishing on Sunday. So there's this competition between them and I probably wouldn't pick someone that everybody in the group would despise. Matthew, who was a traitor to his own people. At least that's what they considered him. They despised that man. And yet Jesus calls him and puts him right in the middle. How uncomfortable. What was he thinking? I mean, we're trying to make this gel, man. We're, we need to get, you know, you ever heard Jesus, birds of a feather flock together? I mean, this doesn't even make sense. And every group has one, right? That person who's very political and all they talk about is politics. Simon Zelotes, a dagger man who would just as soon stab the opposition than to have a conversation. I mean, who wants that kind of guy in the group? How do you talk about Jesus when you got somebody like that? And who wants to disagree with him? And they're telling him what he'll do. But iron sharpens iron. Can I read you a, a passage of scripture that the Lord reminded me of? Um, it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, if you're taking notes. It says, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. You got to work harder with a blunt axe. You make a mess trying to cut up tomatoes pretty with a dull knife. You end up with salsa. The idea is, is when you're blunt, when you're dull, you're ineffective. You're not performing the way you were intended to perform. And this goes across the board, and maybe I sound like a broken record. I don't know. And to be honest with you, I don't care. For me to say the same thing is not grievous, but for you, it's safe. It's safe. 
for those of you who are married in this room, iron sharpens iron. God has placed two opposites together for life. A life sentence with a person who don't think like you think. Who don't like what you like. Who don't do what you do. Who don't react and respond the way that you do. What was he thinking? And for those of you who have children, especially those still at home, he gave them a mind of their own. What was he thinking? Why didn't he make them like little robots until they turn 18 or 21 and then you can kind of flip the switch and kind of push them off the porch and then they could have their own mind and do their own thing. Because iron sharpens iron. Listen, church. You will never, listen, you will never become the man or the woman that Jesus desires you to be without being in the middle of the people he brought around you that frustrate you, that challenge you, that disagree with you, that argue with you, that want what you don't want, push you to do things you don't want to do. I thank God for the Matthews in my life. I thank God for the Simon Zelotes in my life. I thank God for the Jameses and the Johns who want to be recognized above me. I thank God for the Peters who think I'm a flop and he's the only one that knows how to do it. Because my Lord is using those people in my life to make me sharp. To make me effective. To help me accomplish what he wants to accomplish in my life. When's the last time you had a good long conversation with someone who you disagree with? When's the last time you sat at the table and talked to them and listened to them? You might Learn something. Iron sharpens iron. Please, please, please. As your brother, as your pastor, I implore you tonight. Take advantage of this reality. I know the forge gets heated up. And I know sometimes you feel like you're just being hammered on. But God is using it to shape you into what he wants you to be. Sometimes sparks fly. Sometimes you get filed down. But the more that process takes place, two things happen. Number one, we've already mentioned, you become sharper and you become shinier. You, you, can, you can sharpen an edge and keep going finer and finer and finer. I've got knives that not just the top part of the knife, but the part that is honed down and sharpened, you can see your reflection in them. 
you just keep going finer and finer and finer. And you've seen swords and knives, and they just, they just glisten. The Bible talks about God unsheathing his glistening sword. The idea, it has been honed. It has been polished. It is ripe and ready to do what it was intended to do. That's what he's trying to do with me. But my flesh wants to be left alone. My flesh doesn't want to be bothered with you. Now, if you want to come over and play at my house and only watch what I want to watch and only do what I want to do and only talk about what I want to talk about, then you can be my friend. That's not a friend, bro. And if my spouse will only do what I want and only like what I want and only go where I want to go and only eat what I want to eat, then I'll be happy with her or with him. That ain't a spouse, bro. Or if I can find a church that everybody believes what I believe with the tribulation and with the gifts of the Spirit and with all the... Once I find someone that's just like me across the... That ain't church, bro. That ain't discipleship. And you ain't growing. You show me somebody who has spent the last five years of their life in isolation as much as possible. And I will show you someone who has not grown a bit. As a matter of fact, there's a good chance I can show you someone who has digressed. They are duller than they used to be. That's why the writer of Hebrews encourages us, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see that day approaching, that we would encourage one another and provoke one another unto good works and unto love. To spark one, to say, get up, man, let's go. I just want to sit here. No, you're not going to sit here. March it, move it, come on. Will you carry my rucksack? No, bro, you carry that. That's what's going to give you strength and build endurance and make you what you're supposed to be. Let's go. Double time it. Come on. I just don't want to be around people like that. What you're saying is you don't want to grow. That's what you're saying. Because this is a part of the process. I just want to be left alone with Jesus. That ain't, that ain't how it works. It's not how it works. Can we talk about some of the, wow, we're not going to finish tonight. Can we talk about some of the, the attributes of God? How about this one? Long suffering. So I say things like this in my prayer closet. Lord, I want to be like you. I love you. I am in awe of you, in your glory, and your beauty. I just, I'm blown away at who you are. Do what you have to do in my life, Lord, to make me more like you. And so he brings a Matthew along. And then I pray another prayer on top of that prayer. Lord, make me like you. And would you show me what church you want me to go to? Because obviously this is not the one. Because Matthew's getting on my nerves. Matthew hurt my feelings. Matthew told me that I was acting like an idiot. Matthew told me I needed to change this in my life. And I don't really like that. Matter of fact, Matthew's mean. While you're praying the second prayer, you don't even realize that God is answering your first prayer. And now you are contradicting your first prayer by asking God to remove the very thing that he placed in your life to answer the first prayer. Iron sharpens iron. Take advantage of the people around you. Take advantage of them. Now, real quick before we move on. Fellowship to the early church. You can jot down Acts chapter 2 if you want. They didn't wait for Sunday. We live in this corporate, CEO-based, world model type of industry called church. 
where we, we pay professionals to do all the spiritual heavy lifting for us. And if we're not growing, well, it's because of the pastor. And so we're going to go somewhere where we can grow because we're not growing. You shouldn't be leaving where you're at unless God's leading you to leave. That's how you lead. You leave. And although the pastor is commissioned to feed the flock, you are responsible for your spiritual appetite and well-being. They went from house to house. Breaking bread, sharing. They shared communion with no apostle. You mean they had communion without the preacher? Can you do that? They baptized folks without a preacher. They fellowship together. I would love, 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 love to hear, and I hear about it sometimes, but I would love to hear people at the porch inviting someone over to just sit at the table, share a meal. It don't have to be fancy. Bologna sandwich, peanut butter and jelly. It, 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 whatever, it, that's not it. what's important is breaking bread and sitting around the table and having koinonia. Koinonia is and I'm, I'm not against this, it's not watching UFC together. It's not watching the Super Bowl together. Koinonia is sharing Christ with one another. Where you being around me, you feel challenged in a particular area because you see what Christ is doing in me. And me being around you, I'm challenged because I, I see another area and dimension of what Christ is doing in you. And we encourage one another. We sharpen one another, right? We make each other better. We live less dull lives because we're doing this thing that Jesus called us to. Verse 18, whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. Labor is worthy of his hire, and honor comes to those who actually serve their master the way that they should. I want to hear mine say, well done. We probably won't go past this verse, verse 19. As in water... Face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. Solomon says, just like a man can look down in calm water and see a reflection, he can see who he is and what he looks like. The heart of man reveals the man. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's the heart is who you are. That's the real you. That's typically not what you put on Facebook. How many of you know people, uh, I shouldn't say this, I'm going to get in trouble, but, 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 but how many of you know people personally and then you see their Facebook posts and you're like, bro, or girlfriend, that, that, that ain't who you are. I know who you are, and that ain't who you are, but you trying to make everybody think that's who you are. The heart reveals who you are. See, that's another reason why the flesh loves religion. Because religion can cover all of that up. We need to surrender our hearts to the Lord. The writer, of Ecclesi the writer of Lamentation says that we should lift up our hearts and our hands to the Lord. My heart is yours, Lord. We've already studied in Proverbs, guard your heart. For out of it flow all the issues of life. Every issue you have is a heart issue. Every issue you have is a heart issue. 
But the problem you and I have is this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So my heart's my problem, and I can't know it. So how do I fix my problem? I can't. I can't. I can change my mind, but I can't change my heart. But the good news is, is there is one who can. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 139 says this in prayer. And I would encourage you, I would encourage you, if you don't, start praying biblical prayers. If you want to pray a prayer that's guaranteed to be answered, pray an inspired prayer. One that the Holy Spirit pinned. I mean, you can't get better than that. And here's one you can try out. Search me, oh God. And know my heart. Try me and know my ways. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Do you know there's a lot of people that are afraid to do that in God's presence? We're so comfortable with hiding. We're so comfortable with our hypocrisy. We're so comfortable living our social media lives that we, we show up to church thinking that we're a Facebook post. One other verse. Hebrews 4 says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and a marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I, I, I've said it, I don't know how many times. I'm going to keep saying it. I am ecstatic. I, I'm in counseling. I'm in counseling. I've been in counseling. And, and I, I never really understood the importance of counseling. But I gave the wonderful counselor a chance. And my, oh, my, every day his word is just slicing and dicing. Speaking of being sharp and not dull, right? If you don't want a dull life, then let that sword get in there and, and let him start filleting and, and dividing. You know how hard it is to divide soul and spirit? There's a lot of stuff that happens in church that is 100% soul. What that music gets to rocking. You start swaying to that music. Somebody starts clapping. You join in with them, right? And you're just singing, and it feels so good, and everybody's singing. There's just energy in the room, and that might not be spirit. That might be soul. Now, there's nothing wrong with soul, right? God gave us a soul, but, 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 but that's not going deep enough. And a lot of what I do is soul. Oh, I feel it. And, and a lot of my prayers are just... That's fine, that's great, that's part of it. But, but there's the deeper part of me that I can't, you can't, we can't discern between those two things. But if we'll take God's word every day and we'll pray, search me, oh God. Search my heart. I don't know me, but you know me. And more importantly, you know what you want me to be. And you've given me that desire to want that too. And so I'm going to open up your word this morning and I'm going to ask you to discern the thoughts and the intents of my heart. And you'll start hearing things like, Gordon, stop praying hollow prayers. Stop praying hurried prayers. Stop praying hypocritical prayers. You hear things like this. This is what I heard the other morning. You're trying to follow me without doing the two things that I told you before that. 
Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. You are struggling in your following because you're not denying and dying. A discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You say, well, Gordon, that, that, that make you sad? No. That thrills my soul. Really? Is there something wrong with you, bro? Who, who likes to get in trouble? I do. I love getting in trouble. Because when I get in trouble, I'm chastised. And here's what I'm learning. If a father don't love you, he don't whip you. Because he don't care about you. And he don't want to be bothered with you. But mine takes a lot of time with me. And he is patient. And he is kind. And his mercy endures forever. And the more I allow him to work on me, the more I become like my dada. And I don't know nobody like him. And just to be a little bit like him thrills my soul. So I lift up my heart to you, O Lord. And I ask you to search it. And I ask you to do whatever you need to do in it. And you know what I'm starting to see when I look in my heart? It's a face. But it don't look like mine. The more I look in that, and the more I study it, the more I realize I'm seeing someone else looking back. The one I used to be is not the one I see. What? <sighs> Why do I always have to quit? You guys have no idea how hard this is for me. You know, one day, I, one day, I want to make an announcement. One day, I don't know if it'll be a Sunday. Or I, I just, I want to say, we're going to show up and we're going to stay however long we stay. That day's coming, by the way. In eternity. We're just scratching the surface. What I feel right now is just a teeny, I'm going to feel this forever. The people who lead worship on Wednesday are going to hate me because they pick out a last song and they're never going to get to use it. But so we're just we're just going to pray. So let's just pray. Father. Thank you for your word tonight.